and welcome to Western Civ, episode 165, To the End of the Earth. When we talk about the age of exploration, we tend to focus mostly on the Atlantic and the passage to the Americas. To an extent, given later events, I do understand why that is. However, we need to remember that people living at the time would have seen the voyages around Africa to India, particularly before the conquests of the Americas, the fall of the Inca, the Maya, the Aztec, etc., as more important. After all, don't forget, while Columbus was trying to get to India, while Cabot was trying to get to India, Vasco da Gama actually got there. Moreover, he managed to carve out a Portuguese trading empire that lasted nearly a century until it was eclipsed by changes in India and by the overwhelmingly obvious reality that the Americas were a pretty big deal after all. Today, we begin to follow Vasco da Gama as he sought to reach India, not by sailing west, but by simply following the African coast. And in this episode, we really focus on the fundamental questions of why go and what makes Vasco da Gama's voyages so incredibly different when compared to many of the other explorers who went west. After all, at the time that he set sail, this quite literally meant sailing to the end of the earth. The Pillars of Hercules. Since the age of legends, those two stony peaks had marked the western end of the known world. To travel beyond meant to risk one's life. I don't mean that flippantly. Remember, until the late 15th century, the best sailing vessel available was the galley. It worked well in the Mediterranean, but on the open sea it left much to be desired. As we know from our episode on Henry the Navigator, from Ceuta, the land curved into the Mediterranean and deep into Africa. That city had, for 2,000 years, commanded the southern entry into the bay, having been founded by the Phoenicians, who had sailed from Spain to Britain. Between Ceuta and Europe, there's hardly nine miles of water, and that closeness is important. Today, we think of Africa and Europe as two totally different places. But in the ancient and medieval world, they were connected. More than connected, I mean, keep in mind that Hippo Regis was a crucial Roman port in modern-day Tunisia. Much more important to the empire than Britain. Rome had actually leveled the original Carthaginian Suta as an aside, just so you know. Yet, beyond the pillars of Hercules lay little more than the very end of the earth itself. Now everything, and I mean everything, across North Africa and Spain changed in 711 Common Era. That year, a massive Muslim army crossed the straits and stormed through Spain, beginning 781 years of Muslim rule in the Iberian Peninsula. Now, at the time, Spain had been ruled by the Goths after the Vandals abandoned ship. These same Goths proved no match for the Berbers, who streamed north towards the Pyrenees. Tens of thousands of Berbers stormed into Aquitaine and turned 
burning into Bordeaux. They marched north towards Tours, now only 150 miles southwest of Paris. Then suddenly, in 732, the Muslim wave crashed down and broke upon the walls of a Frankish army. Time and time again, the Berber horsemen charged the Frankish shield wall. Time and time again, Charles Martel and his men held. For the moment, the tide seemed to be turning. For the first time describing Charles Martel and his men, the chroniclers used a new term. Europeans. This was a new geographic divide, and I cannot stress that enough. The world was divided now between Arab and European, Christian and Muslim. The first geographic dividing lines had been for centuries. Greek versus non-Greek, Roman versus barbarian, which more and more meant German. Never before had the bounds of Europe been so closely and narrowly defined. Before, the Roman world included educated Africans and Celtic barbarians. Now, the division was much clearer. You were either European, i.e. you lived in Europe, or you weren't. This was the age of Christendom. The modern concept of Europe took centuries to develop. But, with the exception of Spain, in the High Middle Ages, Europe had begun to look like Europe. Now, Spain was different. We know that. We know that from our episodes on the Reconquista. What we now know is Al-Andalus would for seven centuries be part of the Islamic world. And to the Christians, honestly, living in an Al-Andalus, other than paying a tax, little would have changed. Muhammad had himself forbidden his followers to interfere with other peoples of the book, which Christians were. Non-Muslims were not considered the equals of Muslims, but neither were they persecuted. And Christians, for their part, took happily to Arabic culture. They dressed, ate, and bathed like Arabs, earning them the nickname Mozarabs, or wannabe Arabs. As we know, as the centuries gave way, Al-Andalus fractured into a patchwork of competing city-states. And as they fought each other over the northern Christian kingdoms, they started to flex their muscle. The Reconquista took nearly seven centuries as Christians fought Muslims, each other, and then repeatedly shot themselves in the foot by subdividing their kingdoms amongst various sons. As the Christians slowly pushed back against the Muslims, the Muslim greater world was hit with a tidal wave coming from the opposite direction. In the late 12th century, the Mongol hordes swept across the Muslim world. In 1258, the Mongols sacked Baghdad. The city was burned and the people massacred. Worst of all, the Mongols destroyed the irrigation system that for 5,000 years had kept the region fed and wealthy. Now it was destroyed for good. Islam civilizations never truly recovered from the shock of the loss. Crucially, from the 13th century onward, Islam turned inside. Cities that had been the centers of secular learning now became havens for conservatism. Learning was no longer valued. Islam had been punished for its wickedness because it had left the path of righteousness. Now it needed to get back. And time rolled on. 
The Black Death swept across the Mongol trade routes, killing millions from China to the Middle East to Europe. And by the late 15th century, the Reconquista was finally complete. For the first time in centuries, Europeans and Spain began to look across the straits and think about the idea of expansion. It was time for a new crusade. But this crusade would ride the waves of the ocean. This crusade would lead the Portuguese south and west before they would turn east. The caravan stalls in Ceuta set empty. After enormous efforts, the African traders had simply diverted their trade goods to nearby Tangier, eliminating any advantage that the Portuguese thought they might have gotten. Ceuta never turned to profit, and as a city, it was continuously under siege. Henry the Navigator, therefore, pushed his fleet ever further south, searching for some way around the Muslims. After decades of trying, Henry's sailors skirted around Cape Boador, about 500 miles south of Tangier, south of Boador and the Sengal River. The desert finally abated, and the land became more lush. This world was completely new to Europeans. The sprawling mangrove forests extended as far as the eye could see. They saw apes, colorful talking birds, tattooed women, and hippopotami. The men took prizes home, all to Henry, which included the foot of a baby elephant. As the years passed, however, this new world turned sour. Attacks increased. Many African tribal leaders led their men in attacks against the newcomers, whose small cannons were no match for the thousands of spears thrown against them. Compounding the problem that the Portuguese tendency towards violence preceded them, the natives of the south of the Gambia River believed that the Portuguese captured locals to eat them. It was a rumor that persisted for centuries. And to an extent, I suppose it was metaphorically correct. At the moment, the Portuguese actually had little interest in getting to India. They wanted gold, which they had not found in large quantities, and above all else, they continued to hope to find Priester John, the mysterious Christian king who was always just around the next river bend, the next turn of the continent, just over that next hill. Europeans, as I mentioned before, firmly believed in Priester John. Priester, by the way, comes from Old French for prestier, which means pastor. But Priester John was much more than that. He was as real as Noah and his ark. To be fair, though, Priester John was never merely a fable. He was the outgrowth of a string of rumors, frauds, and barely understood truths. Here is what the Europeans thought they knew. In 1122, John, Bishop of India, presented himself to the Pope and described himself living in a Christian realm, the land of Priester John. Two decades later, a German bishop reported that a Christian king was now at war with Iran. This was supposedly Priester John. He was also, it turned out, the Emperor of India. To Europeans, outrageous details made the story more believable. Hence, they were always more prone to believe descriptions such as, quote, horned men, 
One-eyed ones, men with eyes back and front, centaurs, fawns, satyrs, pygmies, giants, cyclops, the phoenix, and almost all sorts of animals which dwell upon the earth, end quote. Elsewhere, according to the same source, 40,000 men stoked the fires that kept the worms that spun the silk threads. Hearing these reports, the Pope, after 12 years of thinking about it, decided to respond. He gave a letter to his personal physician, who set out to find Priester John and never returned. Yet the rumors persisted. Whenever Europe was under threat from the Muslims, Priester John was just sort of expected to show up and save the day. For a long time after Genghis Khan showed up as well, many Europeans continued to assume he was Priester John, and I suppose given the rumors that made sense. Priester John's army was supposed to be three times larger than that of all of Western Europe put together. He was the most powerful man in the world, with limitless supplies of precious metals and gems. Together with the armies of the West, Priester John could wipe the armies of Islam off the map. Well, that is, if you could find him. By the time of Henry the Navigator, most Europeans believed that Priester John lived in East Africa. The good news was, there was already an ancient Christian kingdom there, Ethiopia. Ethiopia was known to be an ancient Christian land. In 1306, after centuries of nothing, European ambassadors unexpectedly showed up at the court of France. By 1400, Henry IV of England was once more writing to Priester John in the hopes of coordinating a crusade. The rumors continued to fly when in 1452, Ethiopian envoys showed up in Lisbon. These ambassadors coming hard on the heels of each other, increased the belief in Europe that Priester John was alive and well and was sure to show up at any given moment to smite Islam. In 1454, the Pope expanded Henry the Navigator's dominions to India in the hope that they could make contact with Priester John, especially after Constantinople fell the year before. Henry had originally hoped to find a direct route to Priester John. He did not. No matter how far south his sailors explored, Africa simply continued. The reality of Africa did not fit with European expectations. The trading posts in Guinea turned out to be sparse, spread out. There was little gold in the items that the Portuguese sailor brought back. Things like skins, amber, seal oil, and dates. They were all certainly rare. They were hardly earth-changing. Without the gold, Portugal needed another reason to expand. In 1444, they found one. Slaves. Chroniclers reported on the spectacle, quote, There you might see mothers abandoning their children and husbands abandoning their wives, each thinking only to flee as speedily as they might. And some drowned themselves in the sea. Others thought refuge in their huts. Others hid their children under the mud thinking that thus they might conceal them from the eyes of the enemy, that they could come to seek them later. And at our length, our Lord God, who rewardeth all that is well done, ordained that in return for the work of this day done by our men in his service, that they should have victory over their enemies, 
and the reward for their fatigues and disbursements in the taking of 165 captives, men, women, and children, without reckoning those who died or killed themselves, end quote. These enslaved persons did not make a better sight once they were in Portugal. Quote, For some kept their heads low and their faces bathed in tears. Looking one upon another, others stood groaning very dolorously, looking up at the height of the heaven, fixing their eyes upon it, crying out loudly as if asking for the help of the Father of Nature. Others struck their faces with the palms of their hands, throwing themselves at full length upon the ground. Others made their lamentations in the manner of a dirge after the custom of their country. And though we could not understand the words of their language, the sound of it right well recorded with the measure of their sadness. But to increase their suffering still more, there now arrived those who had charge of the division of the captives and who began to separate one from another. And then it was needful to part fathers from sons, husbands from wives, brothers from brothers. No respect was shown either to friends or relations, but each fell where his lot took him. Who could finish that partition without very great toil? For as often as they placed them in one part, the sons, seeing their fathers in another, rose with great energy and rushed over to them. The mothers clasped their other children in their arms and threw themselves flat on the ground with them, receiving blows with little pity for their own flesh, if only they might not be torn from themselves. End quote. Henry looked on contentedly. Now he could answer his critics. If he had failed to find the gold, he had found sufficient slaves for the markets of Lisbon. Slavery was, of course, nothing new to Europe. Slavery was well known in Europe and had been for centuries. Slavery existed in Italy and throughout the Muslim world. The church, likewise, approved and issued a papal bull to allow the Portuguese to seize any Muslims or pagans as slaves. Moreover, the Pope allowed the Portuguese to convert these people to hereditary slaves, even if they converted to Christianity. Henry, for his part, was richly rewarded for the slave trade. In 1454, Henry was granted sole spiritual jurisdiction over all the new lands he discovered. For the moment, slavery and Christianity went hand in hand. Now as Henry inched around the coast, enslaving as he went, catastrophe struck. In May of 1453, Constantinople fell. The Ottomans were now in complete control of the east-west trade routes, and the Muslims could prevent any trade they wanted and charge any price they wished. The Pope knew what this meant for the greatest city in Christendom. Quote, Who can doubt that the Turks will vent their wrath upon the churches of God? I grieve that the world's most famous temple, Hagia Sophia, will be destroyed or defiled. I grieve that countless basilicas of the saints, marvels of architecture, will fall in ruins or be subjected to the defilements of Muhammad. What can I say about the books without number there, which are not yet known in Italy? Alas, how many great names of great men will now perish? This will be a second death to Homer and a second destruction of Plato. End quote. Inevitably, the Pope called for a new crusade. The goal was obvious, the recapture of Constantinople. Philip the Good, powerful Duke of Burgundy, quickly answered the call, but other than him and 
by the way, as we know, he was way too preoccupied with the Hundred Years' War to actually join a crusade. Europe in general let out kind of a collective groan. Europe was just too fractured, too secular in 1454. To undertake something like this, it wasn't going to happen. Besides, if Europe was not going to rouse itself to defend the Theodosian walls, it was not remotely likely they would sign up to storm them. The only nation to take the call to crusade seriously was Portugal, believe it or not. King Alfonso V, Henry the Navigator's nephew, seemed interested, but it was clear that a crusade to avenge Constantinople was, for the moment, a non-starter. Constantinople was too ambitious a target for anyone, especially tiny Portugal. So instead, Alfonso poured his energies into a new crusade against Morocco. By Morocco, it seems that both Alfonso and the Pope meant Africa just in general. Alfonso, shortly thereafter, had the papal crusading bull read aloud in a cathedral. And the terms do, to be fair, seem to suggest a lot more than Morocco. They had the right, quote, to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever and other enemies of Christ wheresoever placed and the kingdoms, dukedoms, principalities, dominions, possessions, and all movable and immovable goods wheresoever held and possessed by them to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, end quote. Together with the Papal Bull of 1452, this concept of a moral need for Europeans to conquer and enslave Africa would be trotted out time and time again over the centuries to justify some of the most egregious behavior that happened as a result. In essence, the plan was for this crusade to go around the Ottomans, hit the less stoutly defended parts of West Africa, and then take the Ottomans from the rear. By the 1470s, Portuguese ships were 2,000 miles from Lisbon. Tangier had finally fallen. They'd even found gold in Ghana, a land the Portuguese named the Mine Coast, and that the British would rename the Gold Coast. Suddenly, with real profits coming in, the Portuguese began to wonder, what if there was more? What if Africa did end? What if they could get around the continent itself to India? Suddenly everything might change. To medieval Europeans, the East remained a land of marvels. For centuries, Europeans had very little access to any actual information about Asia. As a result, Europeans quickly retreated into the world of biblical literalism. So at the top of any map, you would find the Garden of Eden, the spring of humanity itself. Now, worst of all, Europeans were completely perplexed as to the actual location of India. And I do mean that literally. They had no idea where India was. India was the location of the most sought after goods in the world, spices. And yet, since Alexander the Great, seemingly nobody had been there. Wherever India was, though, it was a gold mine. Spices were not just essential in preserving food and improving its taste. Spices were a matter of medicine for medieval Europeans. The four humors of the body, exemplified by the four elements, earth, water, fire, and air, needed to be balanced for one to be healthy. And in order for that to be the case, you needed spices Ginger, for example, was hot and moist and needed to increase the libido. Quote, Who wants to make it grand or fortify it for the coitus must rub it before copulation with tepid water until it gets red and extended by the blood flowing into it in consequence of the heat. 
He must then anoint it with a mixture of honey and ginger, rubbing it seditiously. Then let him join the woman. He will procure for her such pleasure that she objects him getting off her again, end quote. Spices were so valuable that it was not unheard of for merchants to stash silver shavings inside bunches of clover to increase their weight, the cloves being worth more than the silver. Customers were seriously angry when they found out about something like this. In 1444 in Nuremberg, the saffron merchant was burned to death when it was discovered he adulterated his wares. Of course, the problem of all this was that spices were in the hands of the infidel Muslims, and so by purchasing them, Europeans were making their sworn enemies richer. Some in Europe balked at the prospect, upset that European frippery was filling Muslim coffers. To quote a first century Persian theme, the greedy merchants led by Lucre run to the parched Indies and the rising sun. From thence hot pepper and rich drugs they bear, bartering for spices their Indian wear, end quote. European merchants were making money, to be sure, but they were the last link in the chain and had been deliberately kept in the dark about where the precious cargo came from and where it was produced. The first real information about the production of spices not reach Europe until the era of Marco Polo in the late 13th century. Marco Polo's travels was actually fairly accurate, at least compared to other accounts. There were no monsters or half-men. Marco Polo was the first European to know about Japan, though his incorrect placement of the island led to severe miscalculations by one Christopher Columbus. Marco Polo never visited India, however. So Europeans know even less about where their spices actually came from than their scant knowledge of China. The last European effort to reach India from the sea going around Africa set sail in 1291. In that case, the explorers did not return. According to legend, they had been uh, taken captive by Priester John for some reason. The biggest change came in 1406 when Europe rediscovered Ptolemy's maps and charts. Now, these were about 1,300 years old, but they provided more of an outline of the world than most Europeans could even grasp. Then, in 1459, the King of Portugal commissioned a new world map from a monk who teamed up with an explorer who had spent 25 years journeying across the East disguised as a Muslim merchant. This new map built off of Ptolemy's but had one crucial change. Africa no longer extended to the bottom of the page. Now suddenly, it might be possible to sail around Africa. One other development helped Vasco da Gama, as we'll see. In the mid-1430s, the Chinese Ming Dynasty began sending massive fleets to the Indian Ocean. The fleet and the treasure that came with it was so impressive that most nations along the coast with India quickly rushed to pay homage to the Chinese. But by the close of the 1430s, the Chinese determined that their experiment was at an end. They withdrew the ships, which clearly would have blocked Da Gama had they remained in place. So this has been a fairly lengthy introduction to Vasco da Gama, in which we never truly talked about Vasco da Gama. But I think it's necessary to understand 
both the intense financial and especially religious imperatives for the voyages around Africa. Vasco da Gama always saw his voyages as crusades. That is a break from Columbus, who wanted to convert the natives, but never intended to conquer Muslim territory. Da Gama almost certainly did. It's crucial to understand that difference of approach if you're going to understand what happens next. Next time, we meet Vasco da Gama and begin the process of rounding Africa for the glory of God and the spices. I mean, don't forget the spices. If you're interested in more, Check out the website, westernsimpodcast.com. Or if you want to support the show, consider becoming a patron. For a buck a month, you get every show early. For $2, you get access to a library of over 20 hours of additional content, plus two to four more hours, depending on the month, of fresh content every month deep dives, author interviews, all kinds of extra stuff. Check it out. Link in the show notes. Patreon.com forward slash Western Zip Podcast. <laughs>